But unique to Florida is that we drill four times a year. And what that means is we have four one-week drills and an OCONUS AT at the end of it. So what we try and do is interrupt civilian lives and careers uh, as minimally as possible, but then on the, on the flip side of that, offer an opportunity to drill for one week straight where we can get really meaningful training in. Welcome back to Leaders Recon, where we will discuss leadership, warrior skills, and other opportunities within the Army National Guard. I'm your host, Captain Carney, and today we're speaking with Lieutenant Colonel Heffernan, commander of the 254 SFAB. Sir, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk to you about SFAB. Absolutely. So, sir, the way that we normally like to begin the show is with an interesting fact that when people hear it, it surprises them. Do you have anything like that off the top of your head? Sure. I'm an avid cyclist. Love to ride the road bike. Okay. So how many miles do you get in on average or how much do you normally ride? I try to ride about 3,500 miles a year. So Holy for cow. me, it's, it's the non-impact aerobic exercise, a lot of fun, like to go for long distance rides. And uh, my wife likes it because it keeps me out of the house. Right. So with like the only, with street tires and stuff like that, do you have to, what kind of maintenance does that require for a bicycle? It's not too involved. You know, you've got to keep the drive clean, uh, drivetrain cleaned and just go over it like you would with any other piece of equipment. Okay. So today what we were going to be discussing is your specific battalion as far as the 254 Security Forces Assistance Brigade. And how long have you been with SFAB organizations? What's your experience uh, up to now with them? Sure. Um, I was the first Compo 2 18 series person to be command directed into the SFAB Enterprise. So for Florida, that was great. We had the squadron, 354 SFAB and 254 SFAB. And I was the fourth person hired into the 254 SFAB for the Florida National Guard from uh, 3rd Battalion, 20th Special Forces Group in order to build out SFAB capacity in the Florida Guard and SFAB capacity overall in Compo 2. Okay. So pr pretty, what year approximately, what was the timeline for the setup for SFABs in Florida? About five years ago. Okay, so you were pretty close to the beginning of it. Very much so. Uh, prior to the formation of the SFAC, or the Security Forces Assistance Command, uh, in Forcecom at, uh, at Fort Bragg. So really on the ground floor. So it was pretty exciting to, to get into it and understand how we were gonna build it out and what it was going to look like, how we would train, and then what we would ultimately look like when we sent our first teams downrange uh, mm -hmm. into an Oconus training environment. Excellent. And so, as I understand in SFAB, it's a leadership heavy organization where you can quickly infill junior enlisted and you essentially have a, an acting battalion. Is that pretty accurate or what is an SFAB? No, it's not. A, an SFAB is really a team of teams. And when you look at it where we have the point of contact, which is the maneuver advisor team, it's led by a post key developmental captain or someone who's already had company command. It has an E7 NCO that's already post uh, platoon sergeant, right? And then we'll have, in, in the case of a maneuver team, we'll have uh, additional maneuver advisors and then subsequent uh, MOSs that facilitate the warfighting functions to fill out a 12-man team. So when you look at it, no, it, it's not just fill uh, NCOs in there to build the team out. What we're looking for are seasoned professionals from that captain all the way down to the E5 logistician that's on the team. So you've got lo uh, logistics, uh, you've got um, explosive ordnance disposable, uh, a medic, you've got uh, your advisor team, uh, your 11 Bravos or, or 19 Deltas that are also on the team. You know, so it's a well-rounded organization, your uh, intelligence advisor. So it's, it's a well-rounded team that looks very close to other organizations that do security force assistance or for an internal defense. Okay, excellent. And so with uh, a different perspective in terms of large-scale combat operations or LISCO, what would you say are some of the highlights of the role of an SFAB in LISCO? Sure, well, in large-scale combat operations, we provide interoperability with uh, a U.S. force package that may come in to facilitate operations in support of the battle space owner or the host nation. So when you look at it, what a, a, a MAT or the advisor team has got at the maneuver element, the CAT or the company element, or even at the BAT, we've got a phenomenal uh, communications package that can reach back inside the United States government and then to different entities uh, within the Army to facilitate uh, 
assets that the United States government has in support of uh, our host nation and partner force. Okay, excellent. So with an SFAB going a little bit back into the history, mm -hmm. the original need of an SFAB, what was really the driving force behind its creation of the SFAB and it, how is it fulfilling that need today? Well, originally you might want to take a look at this and say that it was built for Afghanistan to be able to train the Afghan army, et cetera. Now, uh, when you look at this, there's, there's more work than we have SFAB teams out there within the geographic combatant commands. For security force assistance, we really do feel a uh, significant gap out there and we're an economy of force that can do that. It's to partner with at, uh, uh, our host nation at Echelon and to facilitate their interoperability with uh, U.S. forces. Okay. And with that need and that creation and with you being from Florida, what was the connection that made Florida kind of the general space where SFABs were being created? Why was Florida so important for SFAB creation? Well, that predates me, so I couldn't exactly tell you okay. uh, what the conversation was or, or how we ended up with two-thirds of the maneuver in Florida with 2nd Battalion and 3rd Squadron. So okay. I couldn't exactly tell you how we got it, but I understand that, that we do have it down on the ground. We're filling it out and we're uh, putting teams down in support of geographic uh, combatant commanders worldwide right now. Yes, sir. So with the, the worldwide scope, how many SFABs are there? Well, there's six total SFABs. There are five that are in COMPO, one are active duty, and one in the National Guard, which is the 54th SFAB. Okay. And are they, do they differ from each other? Do, do they have different missions, mission sets, MTOs? No, that's one of the beauties of this. There's absolutely zero uh, deviation from an active duty SFAB to a National Guard SFAB. It's the same requirement across the board throughout the enterprise. Uh, we all go to the same assessment and selection if we need to. Uh, Non-post KD uh, would go to assessment and selection at Fort Benning, Georgia. Everybody goes through the same CAT C at Fort Benning, Georgia as well. So interoperability with uh, the MATS, the CATS, and the BATS is, is definitely there throughout the entire SFAB enterprise. Okay. And just for clarification, mat, MATS, BATS, and... MATS, BATS, and CATS. So when you look at it, the maneuver advisor team or the lowest level led by a captain is your MAT. Your CAT is a company advisor team, which is led by a major and uh, a master sergeant. And a BAT is a battalion advisor team with a lieutenant colonel and a sergeant major. Okay. So, let's see. The only interaction that I've really had with SFABs are in 2018 when I was in Kabul. We were being replaced by... Uh, you, you had some um, memory of this, which, what was the first rotation of SFAB? First SFAB, that's, that's right. Within, uh, it would have been Colonel Scott Jackson, now Major General okay. Scott Jackson, who was the second uh, commanding general of the Security Forces Assistance Command and now the uh, Chief of Staff down at uh, U.S. Southcom. Excellent. So it seemed like they were having a regular rotation of like a, a nine-month deployment. Is that pretty accurate for SFAB? It was then for the two rotations that we had into Afghanistan. So second SFAB uh, ripped first SFAB out, and then uh, we we pulled out of Afghanistan. So we focused the SFAB enterprise elsewhere in the world. Okay, so it's it's no longer nine months, or it's it's shortened no, down. It is no longer nine months, and right now we do six month rotations, uh, boots on ground. Okay, so what does that op tempo look like? Well, for right now, for the op tempo uh, across the SFAB enterprise, it's it's rather high. So we have deployments that execute every six months, and in, in particular to 254 SFAB. I've got a team that will redeploy from Djibouti in the next two weeks. I have a cat that will go to Honduras uh, in the next 30 days, uh, and another team that will go, uh, a mat that will go to uh, Kenya here in about another 30 days as well. And Florida as a whole has got another team that will go to Tunisia. Hmm. So there's a lot of different echelons and team sizes that go into the operability of an SFAB? It is, it is. Uh, we, we, we execute the entire formation and it is on a deployment cycle and the 54th SFAB is part of every deployment cycle that SFAC puts out on the ground. Okay, so with all of those moving pieces going on, what are challenges that SFABs are generally facing through their op tempo? Well, when you have any specialized organization like this, recruiting and recruiting the right people 
uh, is difficult. So I'm looking for a, a specialized person, someone that's a subject matter expert, and someone that's that's an adult, someone that we can put on the ground uh, that understands their uh, culture, understands their doctrine, and can partner well with a foreign country and work in an ambiguous environment uh, to a degree without any adult supervision. So I'm looking for leaders uh, that are adults, that are subject matter experts in their craft. Okay, and how's your recruiting going there? Like, are you meeting those people, you interview them? We do, we meet them, well, we screen them, we send them to assessment and selection if required. Uh, then we send them over to the Combined Arms Training Center or cat C, so that they understand what the culture is with an SFAB and what's expected of them. <clears throat> and then we bring them into the battalion for their foundational training phase. And at the completion of their foundational training phase, we'll execute a training readiness assessment uh, program or a trap and then move them into a collective training phase. And that takes anywhere from six months to a year to get to that point when you come into the SFAB. Collective training is approximately a year, and then we put you into a force package to go down range. So when you join the SFAB, uh, there's a heck of a lot of training that's, that's required. Uh, there's a heavy screening process on the front end of it. Uh, and at the end of that is, is a deployment in support of geographic combatant commanders. Uh, we also offer up to $500 in travel pay for you to be able to come to the SFAB. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for you. And, and understand when you IST to an SFAB state, that you're going to be there through the deployment and then we IST you right back out. So it's not an MOS, it's not a branch, uh, it's an opportunity. And then at the end of that opportunity, you go right back to wherever you came from. Okay. So whenever they're going to support these commanders and they're going on deployments, do they usually have a pretty similar mission or what is the mission of an SFAB? It is to advise, support, liaise, and, and assess the partner force in order to facilitate uh, interoperability with the United States forces. How do I go into a, a country, partner with them at Echelon, develop those enduring partner relationships so that we become the partner of choice uh, with our partner force, with our host nation? And then how do I optimize and improve their interoperability with U.S. forces for future operations? So that seems like it would have <coughs> leave a lot of open space for <clears throat> a dime dynamic. So we have, you know, the military that's flowing sure. in and out of countries. Obviously, we have other um, forces interacting in Africa, in this particular case, in an economic sense or a diplomatic sense. Sure. Does that provide um, any like a, a significant amount of tension for deploying forces? Well, no. Uh, when we look at the, the elements of national power, and you, you just referenced DIME there, we're a small portion of that. We're the M. And when you deploy in support of the GCC, you also deploy in support of the country team. So integration with the team and the country team's uh, objectives, the ambassador's objectives in there is one of the things that's imperative for that team on the ground to be able to do. They're not only there to meet the ge uh, geographic combatant commander's requirements, but also to nest within that country team's requirements and what they'd like to be able to accomplish within that country as well. Okay, so is there any sort of uh, change to where SFABs typically deploy with the, you know, Afghanistan's no longer an option? Um, is there a, a reframing of the trajectory on where SFABs are allocated, perhaps South America or? Well, each one of the SFABs has a geographic correlation to it. Oh, so for okay. instance, first SFAB is, is a Southcom oriented SFAB. Oh. So we support Southcom's uh, needs and intents there and we cover down on all of the GCCs. And when you look at 54th SFAB, we support every single GCC that's there. So with all of the SFABs being similar, mm -hmm. is the M MTO ever going to nope. change or adaptability? Or? Well, the MTO will change just like any new organization will there. Okay. You know, we expect to have some optimization as we determine how we need to meet the, the SFAB commander's needs and desires, and we'll, we'll manipulate the organization to do that. Uh, when we look at substitutable in, uh, MOSs, you know, we found that 89 deltas or EODs uh, NCOs are hard to find, so we're able to take engineers and send them to EOCA and be able to substitute that specialization with an engineer NCO. So you'll see some things that, you know, as we grow and we develop the organization and really optimize the execution of the mission set, what we're going to need in order to, to meet his intent. 
you know, for how this is this will execute. With the if the MTO is not ever going to change, but you're looking for um, well, that's not to say that the MTO is going to change. It's a dynamic environment and right. dynamic organization. So the great thing about having a, a an organization like this is we can make the changes needed uh, for the organization to grow and and to meet its intent and its end state. Absolutely. So. In order to better meet that end state, is there any sort of, in order to support the combatant commands, joint training that occurs with Compo 1 or pre-mobilization, things sure. like that? Well, there is. So one of the things that we do at 254 SFAB is we support the uh, certification and validation exercises of, of first SFAB, if you will. So we provide role players to them. Uh, we've provided the staff to facilitate their development. And uh, we've also been able to participate in their validation exercises, not only as, as a partner force, as a role player, but also to uh, utilize some skill sets that are unique to the National Guard, meaning we have National Guardsmen that are sheriff's deputies, that are federal agents, that can be a role player for them. So for us, what it does is it gives us an opportunity as a Compo 2 unit to be exposed to the training that Compo 1 is doing. So, and then for us, it's, we do that at drill. So there's an economy of force that's, that's definitely realized there for our formation and I think also uh, for Compo 1. Yes, sir. So we've been down to Fort Benning a bit and we've seen signs advertising the SFABs. <clears throat> and so if soldiers were interested and wanted to join the SFAB, what sorts of opportunities are available for soldiers? Well, there's, there's great opportunity if you want to have a broadening assignment, if you'd like to go to additional training and additional schools, and ultimately to deploy in support of the SFAB mission. So that's what you would do if you joined an SFAB. Unique to uh, the National Guard also is that we can pay for drill up to $500. So uh, in the case of 2nd Battalion, we drill on a quarterly basis. So that's four drills and an OCONUS AT. Generally, the uh, ATs are OCONUS so that you can get out and work with the state partnership program to get out and work with the uh, uh, geographic combatant commander down in SOUTHCOM. Uh, we do a trade wins exercise, and most recently we were supporting uh, an Army Service Component Command exercise in Sintam Guardian. So what it does is it gives you an opportunity to broaden your ability to hone your task, to get paid to come to drill, and to also experience you know, training environments and deployments that otherwise you wouldn't get an opportunity to do elsewhere. And at the, the culmination of that, you finish with your deployment and all of that readiness and all that broadening that you've developed goes right back into the conventional force. So you go right back to the unit that you came from. If you're out of a BCT, we can send you back to be a battalion commander, to be a staff uh, officer, or to be a phenomenal NCO that's just had all of this opportunity to, to grow, learn, and develop. Okay. Are there any phone numbers, emails? Where do they? Where would a soldier reach out to or information? Well, just... 54th SFAB is headquartered in Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, and that would be a great place to start. If you're interested in Florida SFAB, you can reach out to 2nd Battalion in Palm Coast, Florida, or 3rd Squadron over in Gainesville, Florida. Okay. And as we sort of gain your insights and come closer to the end of the podcast, as the la over the last five years, what sort of lessons learned have been coming out of the SFAB? Well, it, uh, thank you for asking that question because we were able to go to JRTC last year or last August and exercise the entire brigade in understanding what happens in large-scale combat operations. Going to a, CC a CTC is absolutely a phenomenal opportunity for anyone's career. And I'll tell you, coming out of that Understanding your doctrine, understanding what it is you do, how you fit into the larger scope of the Army and, and what the Army is really trying to do with security force assistance, you know, and becoming the partner of choice across across the globe in support of, of uh, our national interest has, has been phenomenal. You know, how we do that, how we optimize that, how the culture grows, you know, because we are establishing a culture of the SFAB of, of professionalism, of, you know, really being experts at what we do has, has been great. Uh, one of the things that I would tell you, uh, you can never know your doctrine too much. Read, 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 and always be a student because there's so much to learn. So speaking of learning, if there was anything that you could redo or re-implement going back in the past as far as um, the organization of SFABs, what would you do? 
I don't know that I would change anything. You know, when you look at a, an organization that has to grow, it you have to send that cold bore rain or cold bore shot down range first and then adjust fire. We have really been fortunate as an organization to have phenomenal leadership from the top down at the SFAC. Uh, General Landis was the first SFAC commander and, and got the organization up and, and out of the ground, if you will. Uh, General Jackson, who was the first uh, uh, first SFAB uh, brigade commander and, and second SFAC commander, uh, was able to take the organization in light speed forward. And we've just recently had a change of command to uh, Major General Don Hill, who was the second SFAB commander uh, to, to come online and is now the third SFAC commander, and he's just been exceptional. Uh, each one of those general officers has been able to dynamically change shape and move the organization forward. So if I had an opportunity to change anything, I'd, I'd follow their lead uh, because I think that we're a unique organization is one of the newest ones in the Army, but I think we're also one of the most fortunate because I think that we have got phenomenal leadership that really understands how to move the organization and develop it. And I'm glad you brought up leadership because the what I'd like to ask is, do you have any advice for those who are going to be stepping into a leadership role within the SFAB? I would, I would. Uh, you need to protect the brand, be an adult, learn how to make great friends uh, with your partners, and understand, uh, understand your doctrine and understand how uh, to execute your job at Echelon because when you come to the SFAB, you have to be able to advise two levels up. So as we're getting closer to the end of the podcast, are there any final thoughts or comments that you have about soldiers who are interested in joining SFAB? Sure. Uh, the SFAB is a phenomenal opportunity for anyone. There's a $5,000 signing bonus for NCOs to come. You have advanced incentive pay that's associated with it. In Florida, we pay up to $500 for travel expenses related to drill, and that's across the 54th. But unique to Florida is that we drill four times a year. And what that means is we have four one-week drills and an OCONUS AT at the end of it. So what we try and do is interrupt civilian lives and careers uh, as minimally as possible, but then on the, on the flip side of that, offer an opportunity to drill for one week straight where we can get really meaningful training in for uh, all of the soldiers. And then once you develop the readiness, the training, et cetera, the additional schools that's associated with the SFAB in order to meet that mission set, then we're able to IST soldiers back to whatever state they came from, assuming they came from out of state from, uh, to the SFAB, and, and really broaden that knowledge across the force. Okay. Yes, sir. And so, first of all, thank you so much. Thank you and, for the opportunity. Um, how we normally like to wrap up the show is by asking... Um, Two things. If you could go back 10 years and give yourself a piece of advice, what would that be? Continue to cycle. Oh, oh like bicycling. Continue to bicycle. I didn't find the, I didn't find the bicycle till uh, much, much later in life. And it's, it's saving the knees, saving the hip, and a few other things you know, that you get from jumping out of airplanes for a while. Uh, but if I, if I was going to look at it uh, professionally, I would say read more as a junior officer. There's a lot of information out there. You can never read enough. So being that student of life and student of your craft, you know, as a uh, professional soldier is imperative. Yes, sir. And that goes into the, the very last question, which is what resources would you recommend, whether it be doctrine, an electronic tool on a website, uh, things like that? Dive into your doctrine. Understand your small unit tactics and be able to move all the way up because we've changed. We don't do coin anymore. Uh, we do large scale combat operations. And for some senior leaders that have been around long enough, they can remember what large-scale combat operations you know, uh, against a peer threat are. Uh, but for a, a large portion of the formation, this is something new. So they're going to have to study, they're going to have to crack the books, and they're going to have to understand how to execute these operations, and then also how to execute large-scale combat operations and multi-domain operations. Excellent. Well, sir, this has been fantastic, and we really appreciate your knowledge, and uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank so, you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. If you would like more information on any of the topics that we discussed today, please visit our social media pages in the links below. If you liked today's episode, please don't forget to subscribe and leave us a five-star review. You can find us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.